piloted aircraft, or drones, get a lot of attention these days, both for their technological prowess and their heightened role in combat operations. But what's it like for the men and women on the ground operating them? I spoke to Colonel Ross Anderson, commander of the Air Reserve Unit's 926th Wing, to find out. I'm the uh, commander of the 926th Wing. It's a reserve wing at Nellis Air Force Base. My people are uh, embedded in a, in a t total force integrated method with all the active duty mission sets at the Warfare Center at Nellis Air Force Base and in the remotely piloted aircraft community up at Creech Air Force Base as well. Okay. So all my members are reservists and we are uh, active duty teammates with the uh, members there at Nellis and Creech. Okay, great. Um, so you use the phrase remote pilot aircraft. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there's always talk in terms of military not being a big fan of the phrase drone versus remote pilot. Why don't you tell us? What is the distinction? Well, there is a difference between a drone in our mind and the uh, remotely piloted aircraft or RPA. We're, we're comfortable with the term drone, but we don't really like to use the term because that indicates it's not a, a person in the loop, a man or a woman controlling the aircraft. So we prefer to stick with RPA, vice drone. But from the public perspective, we understand what you're saying. We try not to correct you, but I have a chance here, so I'll make the correction. And journalists tend to throw that word in on occasion. Correct. We We appreciate you tolerating that. You bet. You bet. <laughs> um, can you talk to me a little bit about a bit of a day in the life of someone who is remote piling the aircraft? Right. I fly the uh, RPA now. I have an F-16 background, but I transitioned to the uh, MQ-9 about two years ago, and so I, I do have some good familiarity with it. I control and I can I command drone RPA pilots, look at that, you got me going. Yeah, see? But uh, <laughs> I don't have to necessarily fly what they do because they work very, very hard at their, their craft. They uh, typically break up the day into three eight-hour shifts. So they come in about uh, 45 minutes prior to their shift. They do a mass brief together with, where they get the latest information on weather, intelligence updates, and that sort of thing, any significant events that are going on. Then they jump into what we call this, a ground control station. They have a operator, pilot operator, and a sensor operator sit side by side for eight hour shifts at a time. It's pretty grueling actually. I can imagine you sit in a fairly dark room, multiple screens around both uh, operators, and it's a, it's a long day. They get breaks for you know natural causes, that, there, that sort of thing, but it's a really long day. And this goes on 24-7, 365 days out of the year. I mean, imagine every holiday, Christmas, Thanksgiving, there is somebody flying day and night around the world. A lot of it's centered out of Creech. It's also centered from other places across the country, but a lot of it's centered out of Creech Air Force Base in uh, Nevada. It's interesting you bring up a good point because reports have come out, GAO, I remember, did one, I, th I think it was a year or two ago now, mm -hmm. about how there's a growing need for uh, right. remote uh, piloted aircraft, yeah, and therefore you, you there's know. not enough pilots, and therefore the workload is that, expanded that's exactly quite right. a bit. So what's being done to try to balance that for the pilots? Well, it's, a, it's a really a growing industry still. It's a fairly, actually, a immature industry relative to the rest of the military. It's, a, it's, been, it's been coming along really, really fast. It's a capability that the combatant commanders cannot live without these days. And because it's such a remarkable skill set and capability, every time we come up with a little more capacity, the combatant commanders say, no, we want more of that. And so yeah. they try to bring more to the table. And we've been providing that. Every time we can start to come up with more capacity, we're trying to give our folks a break. The combatant commanders say, we'll take that. We want more. So finally, uh, about a year ago, General Welsh, then the chief of staff of the Air Force said, let's stop. I'm giving you this much capability, now I need to make the forces whole again. So we're trying to go through a, a number of programs to basically train more operators, sensor operators um, and pilots, as well as intelligence officers and, uh, and enlisted to try to give the folks a break. Because right now, they work typically five days on for eight hours and three days off is how they're scheduled. But oftentimes, more often than not, they're called in on those days off to come work. Yeah. Somebody gets sick, we're so thinly manned, one person gets sick, and that somebody else has to come in and cover. Mm -hmm. So uh, what the plan is right now is to start pumping up production, more pilots, more sensor operators, and more intelligent professionals, and try to give our folks a break and a little breathing room. They have no time to just do normal things like fitness reports, yeah. uh, rewards and decorations for their people. Uh, all the administration has to, still has to go on in the squadron, but they're not given time to do it right now, and they're struggling. They are working very, very hard. Yeah, and I know recruiting is sometimes challenging. It can uh, has, has that improved over time? Uh, I, I think recruiting is actually going pretty well. Okay. Uh, once a, a person gets an opportunity to serve, especially if they hear about the, the uh, actual mission itself, mm -hmm. 
it's not often that every single day, every single minute of your working hour, you're making a difference. They know they are providing information that is being used right now, real time, by up to 20 different organizations looking at that feed and using that information. It's a no-fail mission, and they know that, and they take pride in that. So recruiting has been going okay. Retention is not going so well. Yeah. They, are, they are stretched to the max, and they haven't seen a whole lot of wins recently. Mm -hmm. And that's what General Welsh got, and Comac, uh, General Carlisle got, and said, okay, we're gonna try to do what we can to fix that. Yeah. So increasing pilot and sensor production, they're also trying to help with the, um, the smaller things, the quality of life things, uh, making it easy to get child care, mm -hmm. uh, trying to help out with the increasing some bonuses and pay. Yeah. So we can bring people in, but retaining them has been a challenge. And I want to ask, you know, the mission of Unmanned is expanding in the military. Yes, um, it very traditionally was surveillance, reconnaissance, that sort of thing. We're seeing it more used in combat operations. Yep. Um, where do you see it going in future years in terms of functionality, and what will that mean for the pilots in terms of training? Well, let's see, I'll start with the where I see it going. I see more. That's what I see. It's going to be used everywhere, but not just obviously in the combat situations or in hostile areas, but where areas where we just we need more information. And uh, whether it be disaster response, uh, you'll see more and more of this in uh, firefighting uh, areas, uh, flood relief, and that sort of thing. Much more of that. So. I just see more and more demand happening all the time. Sizes will change of the platform. When the sizes change in the platform, the requirement's going to change for who's going to operate these things. Some will become more automated and some will become less operated. I think when you're ever you're going to take a life though, you've got to keep a person in the loop. You have to have a decision maker that can make that judgment call and the, the correct judgment call. And we go to great pains, pains to make sure that we do not make a wrong call. When we